Hello and thank you for joining me. Today we will celebrate the Lord's Supper. All that is needed to join in is belief in Christ Jesus, a contrite spirit, some bread, and a beverage. So let's begin by praying for our nation, recalling President Ronald Reagan's prayer from his January 21st, 1985 inaugural address, where he prays to God. And may he continue to hold us close as we fill the world with our sound. Sound in unity, affection, and love. One people under God. Dedicated to the dream of freedom that he has placed in the human heart. Called upon now to pass that dream on to a waiting and hopeful world. And Father God, President Reagan put his trust in you to lead our nation in unity, affection, and love. And we ask today for that same inspiration, that you would give us leaders who would trust you and seek for your will to be done. That we might truly be one people under God and an inspiration to others. And give us the strength to show that unity to other nations of the world. And we ask this in the power of your Holy Spirit and in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. Over the past two years, I've become increasingly concerned about the topic of truth. The cause of this concern is multifaceted. Everything from the problem of truth being relative to our own personal dictates, making all truth relative to our selfish nature, to the real issue behind it all, the underlying motivations of politicians and world leaders to those who seek to profit by defining truth to suit what will line their bank accounts. But before we share all that God has to say on this topic, let's pray. Father God, as we consider your word today, we ask that through the power of your Holy Spirit, you will guide us. And may these words of my mouth and this meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our Redeemer. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's scripture is found in the Apostle John's Gospel, chapter 14, verse 6. So please follow along in your own Bible. I'll be reading from the Holman Christian Standard Bible. John 14, verse 6. Let us hear the word of God. Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is the word of God. Praise and thanks be to God. Today's scripture gives us the ultimate truth. No one comes to the Father except through Christ Jesus. So do we hold this as truth? Or is it just something the Apostle John wants us to believe? After all, scripture does say he was Jesus' favorite. As I began praying and meditating on what the Spirit would lead me to share today, initially I began meditating on the Apostle James, Jesus' brother. I pulled out my notes from two studies I had been involved with, digging deep into the epistle of James. And I did more research into what we know historically about this man. And I began to realize he didn't always believe the truth of who his brother was. And that's precisely when the Holy Spirit broke in, leading me to the topic of truth. And so today's message is titled, Tell Me It's True. Because I find there are a whole lot of folks who would like to know the truth. Noah Webster's 1828 dictionary defines truth as conformity to fact or reality, the true state of facts or things. Conformity of words to thoughts, which is called moral truth. Veracity, purity from falsehood, a correct opinion, fidelity and constancy, honesty and virtue, exactness, real fact of just principle, sincerity. Noah then goes on to say, Jesus Christ is called the truth recorded in John 14. And he concludes his definition of truth by stating, 
To do truth is to practice what God commands, as we are told in John 3. Now, it should be obvious to all that Noel Webster had a deep faith in Scripture and belief in the God of creation. But what do we get as a definition from dictionary.com? The true or actual state of a matter. Conformity with fact or reality. Well, that resonates with what Noah called moral truth. A verified or indisputable fact, a proposition, principle, or the like. The state or character of being true. Actuality or actual existence. An obvious or accepted fact. Well, I share these definitions for us to see how today's definitions differ from the scripture-based definitions of the not-so-distant past. Well, continue our research. Um, let's hear what the Help Finder Bible has to say about truth. In recent years, tolerance has become a virtue. You believe what you want, and I'll believe what I want, and everyone will be happy. But if everyone did what they wanted, it wouldn't take long for chaos and an anarchy to reign. Personally, I believe we are seeing the fruits of this in our world today. But Help Finder continues by saying, human beings have always wanted to reserve the right to determine spiritual truth. While we readily accept truth in other arenas, the effects of gravity, the rules of mathematics, we'd like to pick and choose when it comes to spiritual truth. Now, though I agree about how humans are happy to define spiritual truths, I'm not so sure we can honestly say, today, we all agree on the other truth. As lately, we certainly hear a whole lot about following the science, but we cannot agree on how much of that science is absolute. Well, Help Finder says, there must be some rules, some laws that all people must follow all the time, if this world is to make sense. Well, I agree, don't you? When people follow these rules, societies function well. Thus, there must be some absolute truths set into place from the beginning of time that apply to all people in all times and places. When people live by these truths, the world functions well. Ironically, tolerance which embraces any kind of religion, idea, or belief, denies the existence of absolutes. The only absolute is that there are no absolutes. Now, the Bible makes it very clear that we do not determine truth. Rather, we discover truth. I would add we seek and discover God's truth through the Scripture. We are free to ignore truth if we choose, but we do so at our own risk. Understanding all this, since my initial meditation was on James, Jesus' brother, the one who wrote the epistle of James, let's take a look at how he dealt with the truth. And let's do this in the context of today's scripture where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Well, first, James was a Jew, and as such, he believed in a creator God who had promised a Redeemer, the Messiah, the Christ. But let me interject here. If you do not believe in a creator God, the rest of what I will share may not be of much use to you, because the truth be told, if creation itself does not convince you of God's existence with all of its intricate order, nothing I can say will convince you. But please, investigate James with me. You just might, like James, see the truth. Tell me it's truth. James and Jesus shared the same mother, Mary but not the same father. Joseph, Mary's husband, 
was the father of all their other children. I think it's only fair to share with all of you one of the deep differences between Catholic theology and Protestant theology. Catholics do not believe Mary had any other children. They contend that she remained a virgin to her death. They view Jesus' brothers and sisters as being in the faith, not the flesh. I say this is a serious divide because Scripture records Jesus' brothers by name in the Gospel of Matthew, where we read, Isn't this the carpenter's son? That's referring to Jesus. Isn't his mother called Mary and his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Matthew was not unclear. And if we look a little further at the nativity story, where we read, Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took to him his wife, and did not know her until she had brought forth her firstborn son. And he called his name Jesus. Well, for me, the use of firstborn clearly indicates there were other children. And unless there was another woman involved, all Joseph's children were also Mary's children. But I leave that as a non-salvific fact. Mary and her husband Joseph knew from the very beginning that she was a virgin when Jesus was conceived in her. The angel Gabriel had confirmed it to both of them. But as I've said, James did not believe Jesus was the promised Redeemer. And I can hear him think, tell me it's true that I might believe. This leaves us to consider, hadn't Mary and Joseph told their children the amazing story of Jesus' birth and of Gabriel's visit? Or did James and the other siblings just dismiss the stories as just that, stories? Well, our scripture today was written by the Apostle John. But why should we believe that what John has to say is true? Allow me to point out, John was an eyewitness to everything that he wrote about. He was there. So when John says that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, I'm inclined to take it seriously, as I would anything related by an eyewitness. But let's get back to James and his unbelief. He would have been apprenticed, just like his older brother Jesus, in carpentry. And once Jesus left to do what he had come to do, leaving the family home, James would have naturally been left to pick up the slack, remaining behind to ensure the family's well-being. If we will remember, as Jesus was going about the countryside teaching, there were those who didn't like what he was teaching. They called it heretical. Because of that, the whole family had considered Jesus may have gone crazy. And they went to rescue him. We read in Mark 3, verse 21, when his family heard this, they set out to restrain him because they said, he's out of his mind. So it shouldn't surprise us that James had concerns about his brother. But what changed his mind that he should become a follower? Well, my contention, the truth changed his mind. James knew his brother had been killed and his body placed in a tomb. He was there to see it all. 1 Corinthians 15, 7 records, Then he appeared to James, then all the apostles. It took a personal meeting with his brother after Jesus' death to allow James to see the truth and believe. But can we be certain James truly believed that he wasn't just taking advantage of his brother's reputation to become a leader of the early church? It was a dangerous thing. Well, let me ask a question. Would any of you be willing to die for a lie? I know I certainly wouldn't. James did become the leader of the early Jerusalem church along with Peter. 
at a time when it was not very safe to be a follower of Jesus. The Romans didn't want you around, and certainly the Jews did not. The Roman historian Josephus records, Ananus gathered the Sanhedrin, accused James of violating the law, along with some others, and had them stoned. Ananus was the high priest in Jerusalem. The Sanhedrin was the Jewish ruling council. And like his older brother Jesus, James was accused of violating the Mosaic law and was stoned to death. James died because he accepted the truth he had personally witnessed. And let me tell you, it is true there is nothing relative about any of this. It is absolute truth. Jesus came, took on flesh, died, was resurrected, and lives to give life. He is the truth, the life, and the way, the only way to eternal life. Amen. Meditating on that truth, let us quiet our minds as we prepare to come to the Lord's table, remembering and celebrating the truth of what Christ Jesus has done for us. It was a certain man, Jesus the Christ, who on a certain night the night he was betrayed, commanded his disciples, do this in remembrance of me. This is why we celebrate the Lord's Supper, because Jesus commanded us, and because we never want to forget the price that was paid for our disobedience, our sin. Jesus, in complete submission and obedience to the Father, took on the punishment for all our sins. He bled and died as payment, so that we would not have to receive God's wrath. He did it out of love for each and every one of us. Now, I invite all who know Jesus as Lord of their lives to share in this meal. Gracious Father, bless this bread as a reminder of your son's sacrifice and of the unity of this body. Remind us of the hope we have in you. Bless also this cup as a sharing in the death of our dear Lord as we die to ourselves to live for you. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us now eat and drink together. Lord Jesus, may we be refreshed and renewed through the sharing of this bread and this cup. For we praise you and thank you. Amen and amen. If you need prayer or just someone to talk with, or if you want to even discuss this message, please contact me through this YouTube site, and I will get back to you in a timely fashion. And may your week be filled to overflowing with the love of Christ. And may you dance before him until we meet again, whether it be here 
like having a bike. God bless you.